This week, Nicholas and Alexandra, which last night had its royal premiere. With me, director Franklin J. Schaffner, and Janet Sutzman and Michael Jaston, who play the title roles. Then the week's new releases, which have America prostrate on the psychoanalytic couch. Among them, Drive, he said, and Taking Off. Nicholas and Alexandra is one of those big films. It has stars in galactic quantity, a vast budget, and an epic subject, the fall of the Tsars and the rise of communism. Child's Guide history would have it that Nicholas was a fool and his wife monstrously under the spell of Rasputin. Well, the film is no apology, but it does place some of their failings in the light of their anguish over a haemophiliac son, Alexis, and that in turn is made plausible chiefly by the two main performances. My decision stands. I've seen you out of courtesy. If you've come here to plead... I came to say goodbye, Batushka. I'm going home. I don't like St. Petersburg. It makes me drink too much. And when I drink, the women come. And the women here are worse than the peasants in my village. No restraint. Is Matushka angry with me? She won't admit you even take a drink, much less. No. She believes in you completely. She is a saint. Matushka, if you need me while I'm gone, pretend I'm with you. Say the things that trouble you the way you always do, and that will help. I only sit and listen anyway. The voice of God is in you. necessary. Why? Stolypin recommended it. Our friend warned me he was bad. Rasputin drinks, takes bribes. He is an adulterer. He's a saint. Little men always abuse them. I can show you the police reports. More little men. People say he sleeps with you. What do I care what people think? I have to care. I want him. Bring him back. I can't. Can't you do anything? I am. I'm standing up to you for once. Who's going to save Alexei? We have doctors. Damn you and your doctors. What about my son? I have other important things to answer for. I don't. Give me Rasputin back. No, I will not. If baby dies, you murdered him. I didn't give him haemophilia. Murderer. I'll never forgive you. You gave it to him. It was you. Do you think I know it? No. When I see him bleed, I think I did it. As if I'd put a knife in to make up for it. I've seen so many specialists and doctors and surgeons. Sometimes I did not tell them. I know most of them are quacks. But I still tried. I have spent nights on my knees, praying. And Rasputin's the only one who's helped me bear my punishment. That's why I cling to this common peasant from Siberia. They laugh at me in the streets. You have turned against me. I cannot help it. Swami. It's me. Whatever happens, I deserve it. It's my punishment. It's mine. Last night, as I said, was the film's royal premiere, and as royal premieres are rather rarer than they used to be, everyone sees the opportunity to dress up and go and see the royal family, past and present. Mr. Schaffner, by making the reason for Rasputin's continuance at the court, one of his remarkable, almost miraculous power of recovery over the child, 
Were you trying to give us an agreeable story or something <coughs> that was historically authentic? I think it's uh, not certainly an agreeable story, but certainly something that was indeed uh, historically authentic. There is no question that the agony of the lady played by the lady to my left was genuine and the terrible medical frustrations and the terrible uh, personal frustrations because of the disease of her son because the rumors at the time because the rumors at the time were manifold you touch on some of them she was supposedly having an affair with Rasputin um, there was some suggestion that perhaps he was a German agent many more rumors like that I'm that sure there were hundreds of rumors you know that, that here is a character that was larger than life and there was no question that there were oh, calculated they, thousands of rumors about this man I think that uh, the picture hits closest to the truth certainly he did not have an affair with the emperors. Certainly what Rasputin was trying to do was to retain his position in that society. He retained the position because of the cooperation that the Tsarista gave him. And she depended upon him because he gave her solace in the problem she had with her son. Both the characters, both Nicholas and Alexandra, are very difficult to play. Both are weak and autocratic at different times. Do you feel now that you played interpreter as the woman as she probably was, Janet Sitzman? I think, <coughs> excuse me, I did. The thing was, the difficulty was to sort out all those rumours we've just been talking about from what we hope to be the truth. And uh, I think one did. I think I know her well enough now to say categorically she didn't have an affair with Rasputin. Did you do a lot of preparation for the part? Did you read yes, I did. Period? Yes, I did. Vastly. I found all kinds of now unobtainable books, which you can find if you scrabble around the London Library and things. There was a vast outpouring of memoirs and diaries and all kinds of things around about 1920. All those white Russian emigres wrote and wrote and wrote, you know. And those were fascinating. There's supposedly letters between her and Rasputin, which I believe actually are forged. Did you see any of those? No. Um, very few. I mean, the letters, the really extant letters, are between her and Nicholas when he was at the front during the First World War. The no there are some notes that uh, she wrote to Rasputin, Rasputin to her, but they're, they're usually full of information, like, come here quickly, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> what about the character of Nicholas? As I say, not an easy one to approach. How, do you, how no. did you sort him out? Well, the difficulty as an actor uh, approaching that character was that the character of Nicholas is a weak man. So I had to try and not make him indulgent. I had to try and play him powerfully weak so that he wouldn't become boring, because weak people are very boring if they start moaning about their sorrows. Um, and I had to try and make him, as Janet made Alexandra, a human being, as opposed to a cardboard figure that you often see in mm. historical pictures. There's something about the performance between the two of you that is almost separate from the film as a whole, and I don't mean this as a criticism. It's rather attractive, as though there were a, a quiet, restrained play going on in the midst of this colossal background. Was that deliberate? Yes, very. We wanted so much for it to, since it was called Nicholas and Alexa Alexandra, to be about them and about their, that very, those private moments that we never know about royalty, about what they do in a bedroom or a boudoir, how they talk to each other, what little gestures they make between them holding hands, or something equally simple but equally specific about the relationship. I think one of the most moving scenes is the one where you come back having abdicated uh, and break down completely a scene that you took very near the edge. It was very dangerous and it worked utterly. Well, we, yes, we went out on a limb, but uh, Franklin agreed that this had got to be played full out. We couldn't hold back on it. So in some ways, it was played rather like you would play that scene in the theatre. Yes. We, yes. we pulled out the stops yes. and uh, I think it worked. Yes. Can I come back, um, Mr. Schaffner, to the difficulty of a political situation? Um, I quite deliberately didn't brush up on my background because I wanted to see how much I would readily understand. And a woman next to me in the interval said, well, who is that man in the parliament? And she meant Kerensky. Right. Um, I wonder if you have done sufficient to identify all the personnel involved. I would think so. One of the great dangers, of course, is uh, being in a enormously expository in a film. I think that uh, audiences are reasonably satisfied if sooner or later they are able to identify a character without your laying it on almost immediately. It goes back to the business of immediate exposition. Humphrey Bogart used to say, if I've got to say I'm now in Chicago, put me in front of a waterfall with rose petals coming over. 
<laughs> I'm afraid you're going to have thrown at you, as I suppose you well know, that one line where Lenin says, I'm Lenin, how do you do, I'm Stalin. I am perfectly willing to have that thrown at me. I think that as a filmmaker, the intent was to have an amusing moment. And that's precisely what it is. So that wasn't embarrassed us? Not embarrassing to me at all. The I audience laughed last night. Yeah, yeah it's it? a big laugh. I but it's, a, it's yeah. a moment of, you know, I think it's a very funny situation. A man says, turns and says, I'm Roosevelt, and the other man says, I'm Truman. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad it was intended. Um, epics generally, and, and perhaps you can talk a bit here, too, about your very much decorated film pattern. Um, are they difficult to do? do? Do they daunt you? Any film is difficult to do, just as I think any any theatre, indeed this is difficult to do, this kind of instant drama. No, I don't think that uh, you cast yourself in that kind of context, whether it's a, say for sake of argument, a $3 million picture or a $12 million picture, you can't think in those terms, you think only in the terms of your devotion, your interest your ability to execute that kind of thing. And if you're daunted by the figures, then you might as well not start it. Would you say that Patton, I mean, for the reasons that we've been into, was an easier film for you to make, probably? They were totally different films. I would say, in retrospect, that probably Nicholas and Alexandra was more difficult to make. They're not totally different in that you do give an ambiguity to your leading characters. You obviously like to do this. Those and this made... Those words, ambiguity. Well, I mean that you, you give the character all the complexity they deserve to have in a I long think that film. Best filmmaking is not polarized filmmaking. I don't think Patton was a polarized picture. I don't, certainly don't think that Nicholas and Alexandra takes a polarized position on the characters. And I think that that's what's genuine storytelling, and that's what interests me. But what comes over in both films, I think, and I only guess this, is that you're very much an actor's director? Well, I, I should I'm ask you, Janet. For that. Yes, yeah. indeed. Absolutely. I don't think I've ever come across a director who really pulled out of one so much with the least possible amount of uh, direction, in fact. I mean, it's a, this is extraordinary kind of uh, language, a non spoken language that I go. And I think actors on the whole enjoy that most because once you over articulate about something, uh, you destroy something mm. somewhere. It's a terrible thing to talk about in front of you, and I, I'm sorry about that. No, but, but why shouldn't you say something nice about somebody if you believe it? Uh, you say nice things about people when they're dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't waited that long. No, <laughs> usually that happens. Franklin is the, is, is the most tolerant, humble human being I've met, and he also happens to be a brilliant director. He never shouted once on the set in six months. That's incredible. I will never work for anybody who shouts after working with Franklin. Well, having had that said about you... I'd um, better fade away into the wall. Say, <laughs> say, give me one scene, perhaps, that you would count as the best. What, in Nicholas and Alexander? Yes, between these two. Both. Oh, that's enormously difficult. Uh, may I say, instead of saying one scene, mm -hmm. that as an American director, this has been the most joyful experience of my life, working with English actors. And I must say that for Miss Sussman and for Mr. Jaston, and for Mr. Baker, they are remarkable performers, carrying an awfully heavy load and doing it brilliantly. Well, thank you all very much, and I think, and I hope, it sounds genuine. I can pay a small tribute of my own by showing a bit of pattern, because George C. Scott's performance does confirm something of what's been said. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain this immoderate weather with which we've had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Amen. Patton, I suppose, showed us America at a time when she still had a cowboy faith in her flag, when aggression had a glory. But three films this week show America finding it increasingly hard to sustain the injuries of modern living 
Although war of the Vietnam kind does still haunt the narrative of at least one. And that's Drive, he said. It's directed by Jack Nicholson, who as an actor has already interpreted a good deal of the American malaise. He gave, you may remember, the one and only professional performance in Easy Rider. And he, he can be seen going from sexual superman to impotence in another film called Carnal Knowledge that's on at the moment. But neither Drive, he said, nor any of the other films I want to talk about should smugly be thought of as the problems of another parish. They're all about the different ways that structures, institutions like marriage, the family, the work ethic are breaking down. And if Drive, he said, has a fault, and I think it's a far better film than most reviews would have you imagine, then it's because it takes on too many targets. It demands a lot of concentration, and it doesn't give you an easy narrative guide. It uses images to say what it means, but very simply, it's about three people, a college ball game player with a draft-dodging flatmate and a chain-smoking bedmate, although she's actually married to a complacent professor. And it uses these people to demonstrate that the war, the consumer life, the game, are all actually the same thing, with the same aim, to win. And using the structure of the game as a metaphor, it shows that not only has the aim itself become fatuous, but the very moral virtues the game was designed to keep supple have become strained. So to give you a better idea of just how this American dream has come to look in the light of day, here's a clip where the girlfriend, played by Karen Black, is visiting paradise itself, an American supermarket. All right, go ahead. I hate it already. Yes, so? Out of please. Do you steal? So, what about the recipe? How long have you been stealing? <laughs> For years. Why? It excites me. Sexually? No, Hector, you wait. I'm trying to tell you something. Real. It's really sad, Martha. I'm pregnant. Pregnant? Richard and I are very happy. Who's is it? Hector, why make this more pain? It's mine, right? Have you been following him? <gasps> I hate you for I'm that. asking you for a reason. What? I got the clamp. You notice the music in the background. I'm delighted to say that Rank have reopened Milos Forman's first film, In and About America, Taking Off. That deals with a common form of fracture in the family, the generation gap. Forman's great gift is a wit that never lacks sympathy. Using Buck Henry and Audra Lindley as the parents of a missing teenage girl, he makes, out of their bewilderment, a comedy that rides very close to sorrow. As one familiar unit falls apart, he shows people blindly regrouping into another for comfort. In this case, a special society for the parents of missing children. Here, Buck Henry, having spotted someone else's missing daughter, is about to be co-opted. Another remarkable musical backing. There's another very funny sequence where all the parents trying to penetrate the mysteries that separate them from their children are given a pot training session. And when I say pot, I don't mean the kind that you all once sat upon. It only serves to show, though, that by imitating people, you don't really come any closer. Instead of understanding, you simply increase the distance and contempt. And much the same could be said for another film, The Marriage of a Young Stockbroker. This, again, is a funny film, but it could have been much funnier had the rest of the cast not left Richard Benjamin to do all the comedy on his own. Joanna Shimkus is his wife who is, I think, the most beautiful actress working today, is not, I'm afraid, a comic. But it's rather difficult for her, because she and all the other women characters are really the villains of the piece. 
It's about that peculiar female habit of provoking a man out of his mind by bending over in short skirts and low necklines. And then the moment they've got the man to themselves in marriage, convincing the poor fellow he must be psychologically sick to want unnatural things like sex and looking at ladies with no clothes on. It's the first film I've seen in months with a happy ending, although to make the marriage happy, the young stockbroker has to divorce his wife first. He delivers the document to her at a time that could have been better chosen. Lisa, dry off and explain to me why you were here playing tennis. Why I was? Playing tennis. You mean to tell me you burst in here to find out why I was playing tennis? No, but it's interesting. Because you hate tennis. Why do you do things you hate? I must be crazy, too. One minute I want to be a model, and the next minute I realize how stupid it is, and then I think about having a baby, and then the modeling again, back and forth going on like this every day for a year now, Bill. We're screwed up. Mm, we have been, Lisa. I want to be on the cover of Vogue and you want to have sex orgies with Eskimos. What kind of a marriage is that? Probably a normal one. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the 15th London Film Festival and I said there were good reasons for festivals. Well, this one's ending tomorrow and has proved my point. The director, Ken Blashen, reports a record number of 40,000 admissions. But most surprising, perhaps, is that seven of the films shown are banned in their own countries. Hopefully, success abroad is going to soften hearts a bit at home. And at least ten films the public might not otherwise have seen have found distributors. But one hasn't, and that's Jacques Demy's fairy tale film, Donkey's Skin. I had a letter from a distraught mother last week. How, she said, can I get my children to the pictures en famille? Every U film seems to be on with an X. Well, it's surprising how right she is. Demi's film is the perfect answer. It's about princesses and kings and castles, and it's absolutely lovely. People have got blue faces, red horses, roses grow on the inner walls of the palace, and the bedspreads have got buttercups all over them. It has, in Monsieur Demi's slightly off-key English, a pure story for children and a perverse one for grown-ups. In other words, as I say, it's perfect and should have a release. Until it gets one, may giant toads rain down on Water Street. Good night.
aqui Good evening. Tonight, Joseph Losey talks about the assassination of Trotsky. Michael Caine teams up with Mickey Rooney in Pulp. We take a look at Shirley MacLaine in the possession of Joel Delaney, and we'll be looking at the work of the British Film Institute Production Board. for a film on Trotsky. Uh, uh, in fact, even the youth don't know who Trotsky is. And when there, there was a sidewalk canvas in Paris about who was Trotsky, and they said, uh, isn't, he a, isn't he a football player or isn't, wasn't he a ballet dancer? And I think one said, I, didn't he have something to do with the Russian Revolution? Well, this is a man who was the t chief theoretician, the theoretician next to Lenin, the, the, the undoubted organizer of the Red Army, uh, the co-founder of, of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, and uh, uh, less than, well, around 50 years later, uh, the world doesn't uh, know whether he's a ballet dancer or a pop singer, you know. So what, 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 where does your interest in him, in him stem from? Well, my interest stems from um, um, an inescapable uh, awareness of that life is in this century and now is political which has been with me since um, I left university. Mm -hmm. um, unhappily, I don't like it. Joseph Losey is the expatriate American director who for several years now has made his home and most of his films in Britain. Films like The Servant, Accident and The Go-Between. Well now his latest work, The Assassination of Trotsky, is about to be launched on an expectant world. It stars Richard Burton as Trotsky and Alain Delon as the assassin who hacked him to death rather untidily with an ice pick. The film's to be shown at the Edinburgh Festival and won't be on general release for some weeks yet. That being so, it'll be reviewed on this programme at a somewhat more appropriate date. Meanwhile, here's a foretaste of what to expect. My wife Natasha and I were in the bedroom when we heard the sound of firing. Immediately we flung ourselves under the bed. Natasha tried to protect me with her body. I made her lie down. It was this that saved us. You threw yourselves beneath? Beside, beside. Where there were hundreds of bullets. Are you suggesting I'm immortal, Colonel? I'm suggesting you were not in the room. You were warned. By the raid, you achieve a certain sympathy. And do I achieve my own death? What aim could I possibly pursue in venturing on so monstrous, so dangerous an enterprise? Why? What for? I would have risked my own fate, the fate of my family, my political reputation, the reputation of the, of the people that I serve. What did I stand to gain? Luck was on the side of the just. The intruders were incompetent. Then why did none of your guards fire back? They're Americans. Perhaps they, uh, they have too much respect for police uniform. Do you trust them? Completely. In my profession, you learn to trust, Colonel. I love that boy. He may be dead. You won't cover up. Anything else but not this. 
There are murderers in this city, saboteurs. You know them. Arrest them. You have a theory who was responsible? I most certainly do. Joseph Stalin. <laughs> the assassination of Trotsky has opened so far only in France and Italy and hasn't been very well received in either country. I asked Joe Losi for his reactions. I think that one of the reasons for disappointment in France was that it was not sufficiently political. Uh, obviously, they, there's a big contradiction because you've got to go to big business for money about a revolutionary. And I had to contain the film within the three months, the last three months of his life. And uh, this was the only way practically or aesthetically that I could do it. And um, uh, so obviously it will disappoint people who want a strong political film. The, the assassin seems to be presented throughout as a, as a kind of, largely as a kind of psychopath. Is, is that not a, a slight oversimplification? I would think Trotskyites are convinced that uh, his motives were coldly political all the way through, aren't they? Well, I, had, I, I spent a great deal of time on this film. Over, over, over a period of time, it wasn't so long. It was about 15, 16 months. But it was very concentrated. And I spent uh, uh, a lot of time talking to people, including the psychiatrist who had spent a, a thousand hours with uh, the assassin, whoever he is. He's generally believed to be America there, but at the time the, that the film covers, he was not known, and he was not known if he is America there for 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the psychiatrist said definitely, and I thought I had made this clear in the film, that he was not a psychotic, mm -hmm. that he was a neurotic, uh, that he was a uh, uh, repressed homosexual, uh, that he had lots of uh, sexual activity with women, but always with prostitutes. Um, he apparently, and I say apparently because it still isn't proved, came from a strongly political background. And I have, he, he, I must say that the psychiatrist, uh, when I said, did he act out of uh, principle? And he said, absolutely out of principle. Uh, Mexico was the very last refuge for this maker of the Russian Revolution. And I think in a kind of way he wanted to get it over. I mean, when it, and I think he knew that this was the man, too, in a sense. But when it happened, um, he fought for four minutes. Mm. And this terrible instrument buried itself in his head two and a quarter inches deep. And he didn't even lose consciousness, and he fought quote, like a bull, uh, and indeed he did, as I've shown in the film, and this is all entirely accurate. The bullfight sequence was a particularly long and, and, and very gory bullfight. I wanted to make the bullfight as ugly and as, uh, as brutal and as terrible as I could, uh, partly because I loathe bullfights and I loathe this kind of human indulgence and uh, partly because it seemed to me that people are so much more concerned about animals than they are about people, uh, particularly in the British Isles, that uh, uh, maybe it would be a good thing for them to suffer a bit about animals and then see what it meant when it was applied to a human being with the most enormous intellect and the physically most enormous brain of this century. But that, <clears throat> that surely is a bit optimistic because after all, in the film, you're. You're presumably watching an actual bull being killed in an actual bullfight. What do you mean by presumably? You well, are. I, I meant, yes, I'm, I'm sure you, you didn't set this bull up and have it no, killed, I especially for your film. Um, but then later on, you're watching an actor pretending to be killed, and, and, and it's the, the emotional response is very different, isn't it? Uh, I don't think so. And I think the actuality of the bull makes the, uh, the actor more actual. I, I don't see how it can, can be otherwise. And that was my intention. Uh, one of my very close friends, and a, a, a man who has a very strong political point of view, uh, uh, said uh, the only thing that he found wrong with the picture was that the bull couldn't fight back. Uh, and this, in a sense, is true, and that's where, in a way, the symbol falls down. And, you know, bull, bull fights are uh, spectacles and are pageants and are choreography, primarily because your audience in a big stadium always sees it in long shot. Uh, and I didn't permit them to see it in long shot. It's all in close-up. But it is, I think, discreet in spite of that. If you'd seen the actual thing, you would agree.
very nasty, that. Now, evil Knievel, well, the, that's what it says here, is a quaint little oddity about a man called Evil Knievel, who claims to be America's king of the stuntmen. And I suppose with a name like that, you'd have to do something fairly dramatic. I mean, you could hardly set yourself up in business as a lawyer or a bookmaker if you were called Evil Knievel. Anyway, George Hamilton plays this remarkable man who spends his life doing death-defying stunts with motorbikes and cars, and as a direct result appears to be held together by nuts and bolts and bits of metal plate. There's one piece of metal two feet long which keeps his right leg attached to his hip, and I imagine if you went too close to him with a powerful magnet, you'd never get rid of him. Here he is now, preparing to leap his motorbike over a row of 20-odd cars. Pulp reunites Michael Caine and Mike Hodges, the director, who together made Get Carter. Pulp's a bit different, though. It's a comedy thriller that sends up the kind of tough, unsubtle detective story that Mickey Spillane used to write, and for all I know still does. The sort of books in which the hero shoots a man in one eye in order to enjoy the somewhat reproachful look in the other eye. Caine plays a writer of such books who's hired to ghost the life story of a retired Hollywood gangster actor, and indeed gangster, played by Mickey Rooney and thereafter finds himself involved in multiple murder and other kinds of disorderly conduct. It's not at all a bad film, and in fact much of it's very inventive and funny, but rather too often Mr Hodges, having created quite a clever situation, ruins it all by going for the quick, cheap laugh. And from the way it finishes, I can only assume that he had no idea how to end it at all. However, there's a delightful, but alas too brief, appearance by Mickey Rooney, burlesquing the roles he used to play in palmier days, the reappearance from retirement of Elizabeth Scott, the introduction of an actress called Nadia Cassini, who seems to consist entirely of legs, and a couple of neat performances by Mr Kane and Lionel Stander, altogether a reasonably enjoyable night out at the pictures, if you happen to be in the right tolerant mood. We didn't order spaghetti, did we? We didn't order spaghetti. You didn't order spaghetti? No! Oh, oh, that, that, oh. I'm so sorry. You didn't order spaghetti. Oh, oh. sir, excuse me. I, I, I'm so sorry. You don't like my spaghetti, sir? You you don't like my father? I have nothing to do with your father. But you have something to do with my spaghetti. You oh. don't... Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I am so sorry, madame. You said... Excuse me. I We've had mean. enough of this. Yes, everybody's had enough of it. The boss, he's going to take me to the cleaners. What do you think he's going to do to me? I'm in plenty big trouble. I'm in trouble up to here. Would you like a banana split? A brandy? Brandy, banana split? Don't worry about it. You ain't gonna get nothing if you order it. <laughs> like, wait, don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of the check. I'll take, like, look at it, honey. It's all a fun. It's all a fun, lady. <laughs> it's all a fun. <laughs> Gilbert was proud of being the great practical joker. He could afford to be. Suddenly, it hit me like a bad tomato. I was top billing in his latest production. Only it wasn't a comedy. That made me angry. <laughs> Oh, senor, senor, I am the manager. Champagne on the house. Uh, the waiter. Uh, it's weak in the bladder. Runs to the family. I fired him. Oh, please don't. Oh, do it's that. quite all right. He has a wife and 30 children. He may starve, but he'll never be lonely. You all right, senor? Fine, fine, fine. 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 Excuse me. Everything all right, senor? <laughs> the humor is a little rough. Uh, back in Hollywood, I used to put all those slobs on. They used to pay me good money to put those people down at parties. Rib them a little bit. Some nights I'd make as much as 50 bucks a night. <laughs> Those were the days, huh? 
Waris Hussein, the young Indian director, may have defeated his own objects with the possession of Joel Delaney. My immediate reaction to the film was one of great moral indignation because it ends on a scene of tremendous and at first sight gratuitous violence. Very cleverly done because hardly any blood is shed, but extremely effective and even distasteful. Also it involves children and I always feel it's unfair, if not downright cheating, to use children in scenes of violence and terror. But it would be a pity to place too much emphasis on this gut reaction. The basic story about voodoo in New York and the possession of the body of Joel Delaney, a young white liberal by the soul of his Puerto Rican homicidal maniac friend, is more or less straightforward supernatural horror. But there's a lot more to it than that. Quite apart from the fact that Mr. Hussein draws from Shirley MacLaine the best performance she's given for quite some time, the film's full of delicate, understated touches. The contrast between Spanish Harlem and Fifth Avenue, for instance, the general undercurrent of menace in the city, the throwaway shots of the Bellevue Mental Hospital that make you think, please God, I never have a nervous breakdown in New York. But beyond all that, there's a strong and valid political message for anyone who wants to seek it out. And here I think Mr. Hussein fails, although honourably, it's a film that needs thinking about, and he doesn't encourage you to think because he leaves you with a powerful emotional response that overshadows what's gone before. Even so, it's an interesting picture with a lot of interesting ideas. Since 1966, the British Film Institute Production Board has financed 70 short films and two features on a slender, some might say downright skeletal, budget of about £30,000 a year. Among the people it's helped in the past are Jack Gold, Peter Watkins, Carol Rice, Tony Richardson and Ken Russell, who's lately taken to biting the hand that once fed him by attacking the BFI in the press on the grounds that it squanders money. Well now, somewhat to Mr Russell's dismay, the board has been granted an extra £40,000 a year, with which, as before, it hopes to help and encourage people who otherwise would have no chance to make films on their own. One of its more recent productions, My Childhood, which cost just over £4,000 to make, has been chosen for the Edinburgh, London and Venice Film Festivals. This is an autobiographical film by Bill Douglas, a one-time miner and actor, about life in a Scottish mining village at the end of the Second World War. I found it impressive and moving, and I think it reveals Mr Douglas to be a man of much talent and promise. It shows the sadness rather than the joy of childhood, as in this scene where Tommy, the elder brother, takes a terrible revenge on the cat which has quite literally eaten his canary.
With me now are Mamoun Hassan, the board's production officer, and Bill Douglas, the writer and director of My Childhood. Now, Mr. Hassan, first of all, the thing that puzzles me slightly is what happens to these films the board makes, because I'm, I never actually see them. When I go to the cinema, they never seem to be showing. Now, why is that? Well, I don't know that I'm the right person to answer that question. Uh, the people um, who buy films and show them are the people to answer that question. I think uh, there's a resistance to the idea of experiment because they equate experiment with artiness. In fact, our films are not arty at all. But so, so where are they shown? Okay. Well, they are shown in the cinemas. They're shown on TV. They're shown abroad. Uh, for instance, My Childhood is going to be shown at the Academy. But um, w we do find it somewhat hard to sell these films. Mm. Uh, I wanted to ask, actually, how you, how you choose the people to whom you're going to help, and I thought perhaps Bill Douglas might be able to answer that, first of all, from personal experience, having made my childhood. Um, choosing me, um, well, first of all, they had to see a script, mm. and um, they also had to have some example on film of something I've done. Uh, if you don't have a film to show, then you're required to do a test piece, which I think is fair. Um, I submitted my script and a film, a short film, and I found the board liked the film enough to put up the money, and I just simply went straight ahead and planned and shot the film. So c can anybody, in fact, apply to you for help? I mean, Absolutely they, anybody. They don't have to be in the film industry? Or no, not at all. In fact, um, anybody can apply. It. And the procedure is simple, although it takes a long time. Yeah. Uh, I read every script or treatment, and we don't expect to get a, a standard kind of script. You know, it must be written um, in the way that the person wants to make the film. And as we want original films, therefore the script itself, uh, its layout and the way it's presented, you know, tends to be original. Uh, now, I read the script and I pass it on to two other members of the board. And at that stage, we decide whether it's going to go to the final committee. Mm -hmm. And I also show any previous work um, of the applicant. And about 1 in 15, 1 in 20 get to the board in the end. We get about 1,000 applications a year. What about these a allegations of wasted money that, that have stemmed, I think, first of all, anyway, from Ken Russell, and other people have taken up the cry. And he does say that, that all the films that the board makes have been financial disasters. Is, is this true? I think this is a complete misunderstanding of what our role is. We're not a production company. We are a place for research and development. And as such, we are there to take risks. You know, when we decide, you know, when the board decides whether a script is going to be backed or not, we don't think is this saleable or not. We think, does it work in the terms that the filmmaker wants it to work? Mm. And uh, to say, look, it's not actually saleable, well, it's not meant to be. Although after the film is made, we do want the film to be shown. We don't make films, so it's end up on a shelf somewhere. We do want the films to be criticized. We do want the films to be assessed. And if the filmmaker is going to have any... Um, part to play in the industry, or even outside the industry, if he so wishes, uh, he, you know, his work must be seen. Well, I'm Bill Douglas. I mean, obviously, you, you want your film to be seen as widely as possible, I imagine. That's the idea behind making it, yes. But do, do you have any obligation to, uh, or do you feel any obligation to, to try and recover the costs of, of the film? No, it's just, you know, that if we make any <coughs> money, part of it will go to the, you know, to, the, to the people who've worked on the film, and they get very little money while actually working on the film. And part of the money goes back to the board, which means that, uh, you know, that we're able to spend a bit more money. Of course, you know, but that isn't the point. The point is to get the film made first. And after the film is finished, without using any of the kind of ingredient kind of standards of the industry, does it have this kind of ingredient or that or whatever? But, you know, once the film is finished, we do want it to be seen. Now, Ken, Ken Russell's other criticism, you see, is that uh, you actually haven't launched any directors since Tony Richardson and Carol Rice quite a long time ago. How do you answer that? Well, it's not true. Um, you know, with uh, Jack Gold is one, uh, John Irvin is another, Robert Vash is another, Michael Grigsby is another, Michael Gill, John Hawksworth, John Irvin, and so on. I mean, there are a great many. We've also launched not only directors, but also cameramen like Walter Lastly and editors like uh, uh, David Gladwell, who cut If. Uh, but again, that isn't the point. I mean, you know, we have had our successes. We don't claim that we've launched them. All that we claim is that we gave them a chance at an early and critical stage. We don't take the credit for the work that they do. No, I'm sure. You know, and I think uh, this is probably a thing that irks you know, some of the directors. You know, they think you know, that we, you know, we're saying if it wasn't for us. Well, in some cases, that might be so. I think in the case of Bell, I don't know whether he would have you know, been helped you know, by the industry. He's making a film which is a personal film, which hasn't got the ingredients that the industry wants. And... Uh, I don't know whether he would have been able, you know, to get the film off the ground without us. What, what, what happens next? Uh, what, uh, do you have any other projects with, with, the, um, with the BFI? 
Well, I, I have written part two. The son oh. of my childhood. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, okay, son of my childhood. But, I mean, that, it was, is that going to be financed, in fact, by the... Um, well, that depends on the board. They have to decide themselves. I mean, I think it's good. I mean, it's just the same as the last one. Very briefly, what difference is this extra £40,000 a year going to make? Well, one of the things that we noticed um, over the last year or two is that most of the scripts that we got were not for short films any longer. Uh, most of the people were applying for 50 minutes from 60, 70, 80, and even 90. Some coming from people like Bill, who'd been to a film school and had made it a 12-minute film or a 15-minute film and wanted to do something really larger. Um, or people who are working in the industry but are unable to get yeah. the films off the ground because of high artistic risk. So you'll use it to help them in the future? That's right. Fine. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanson. Mr. Douglas. Thank you. Absolutely. Another film going to Edinburgh, thanks to the BFI Production Board, is A Fortunate Man, made by Jeff Perks at a cost of nearly £3,000 and based on a book by John Berger. It's a study of a doctor in the Forest of Dean and of the underprivileged community in which he works. It's a very uneven film. Some of it is clumsy and gauche, but on the other hand, some of it's also very good. This scene, for example, where the doctor, played by Michael Bryant, the only professional actor in the cast, talks to one of his patients. Doctor, can you tell me if I be too old? I don't want it no more. Jack to say it's because I be too old. Of course you're not too old. You're still a young woman. It's to do with you being overtired, that's all. Sometimes I do just wish I could lie down and stop. Do you like music? Don't mean nothing to me no more. When him to make love to me, it's like a wet rag across my face. Sometimes I'd almost scream if him would stop. Jack to say it's because I'd be too old. But I know what it was like before I come to him. I was always a generous girl. But the father of Stephen, when I got Stephen, it was beautiful. Jack's a steady, quiet man. Stephen's dad was wild. Jack to say it don't matter. It's just a physical thing. If Stephen's dad was to come in here this minute. Finally, John Houston's latest picture, Fat City, which, like so many other items in this week's programme, is being shown at the Edinburgh Film Festival, and I'll be reviewing it next week. Fat City is a sweaty look at third-rate boxing in a small American town. Stacy Keach stars as a washed-up prize fighter. And Jeff Bridges plays an ambitious, though not necessarily very talented, young boxer. Here's a glimpse of both of them, and more next week. Good night. Hey, you all right? I don't know. You make it? Yes, I'm drunk. Don't worry about anything. I'll get you home. You can count on me. You going the right way? Yep. Hey, what's the matter? Hey. I love you so much. Hey, come on. Hey, everything's gonna be okay now. I feel it is. It is. You can count on me. Right. But I can count on you. Yeah. All right. You can count on you. <laughs> and you can count on you. <laughs> and we can count on each other. <laughs> Why look all right on me? Perfect. Are you professional? Amateur. Won his last three fights. They couldn't touch him. Kids fast. What do you think? Yeah, it's just the right image for you. When you come out from that, you're going to look like a champ. The champion of the world. <laughs> It must be the long nights drawing in. There's a bumper crop of horror films this week, something to affright every taste. And we take a good look at the new John Borman film, Deliverance, with comments from John Borman himself.
done wonders with the local fish. Dr. Fives in the extravagant form of Vincent Price eating through his throat. Well, what has happened to the dear old horror movie? Time was when horror films were horrifying. They were always funny too, of course, because the knife's edge between the two is precarious, and anyway, laughter is often defensive. But the very best horror, usually filmed in black and white, gave me many a sleepless night, usually because it successfully tapped the terrors that lurk in the shadows of the mind. That's how it was filmed, too. Billowing curtain, creaking door, tapping of twig on window, and the pulse was racing. Now all the great Gothic myths have been dragged from the cobwebs into the sunlight of Technicolor. Perhaps it's the rational times we live in. Ask almost anyone these days what evil powers are abroad in the world. They'll probably mention several pollutants and several politicians. Satan just doesn't rate. And death is today's unspoken subject. Computer man, it seems, has lost his sense of the supernatural. So ideas of life beyond the grave and the powers of darkness, the spiritual conflict of good and evil, all once the life's blood of gothic tales and horror films, are now reduced at a commercial cockcrow to a handful of dusty jokes. Not that jokes are a bad thing. Robert Fust's Dr. Fibes Rises Again thrives on them. That and a modish taste for Odian design discovered beneath a pyramid where Fibes seeks eternal life for his dead wife and subjects everyone who gets in his way to a nasty and extremely complicated death. Not high gothic, but certainly high camp. Why it has an exit certificate, I've no idea. It seems ridiculous when the one person I'm sure would enjoy it is my eight-year-old son. Tales from the Crypt, directed by Freddie Francis, is intended as five characters in search of their conscience. Mistaking their way in Highgate Cemetery, they stumble on the keeper of the crypt, one Ralph Richardson, who forces each one to live out the nightmare tale that brings them there. The most appalling deeds are then acted out with the casual banality of a vicarage tea in affluent suburbia, which is where most of them take place. There's something essentially practical about Joan Collins rinsing blood from a wine glass that takes away all terror and puts one in mind of Katie and her Oxo cubes. The cast is starry but score low for effort. Here's Barbara Murray making a wish and proving you just can't trust that cheap Hong Kong rubbish. Please. I wish Ralph were alive now. I don't want him to die ever. I want him moving, breathing, talking, alive. Now, forever. What happened? What have you done? I wished him alive again, forever. But don't you realize he's been embalmed? His veins are filled with embalming fluid burning into him. Oh, no. Oh. Do something now! Ah, 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 oh, for God's sake, Edith, help! Ah, 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 ah. No, no, Edith, 
wished him alive forever. I can't kill him. Every piece of him is alive still. Alive and suffering forever. And all he did to deserve that was go bankrupt. Dracula AD 72 is the latest from Hammer and centers around a group of trendy youngsters out for kicks who conjure up Dracula in a derelict churchyard just off the King's Road. One of them, Johnny Alucard, Yes, it's Dracula spelt backwards. Gets the message and starts biting his friends. This film breaks what for me is a cardinal rule of horror. Suggest rather than show, hint rather than demonstrate. Here it's all buckets of blood and stakes through the heart a go-go. The two protagonists are our old friends Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Now, Vampire, currently at the National Film Theatre, is something very different. The Spanish director, Pedro Portobello, who worked with Bunuel on Viridiana, follows the filming of a Spanish commercial horror film, Christopher Lee again, and comes up with his own version, black and white, slow-moving, speechless and weird. Sometimes he's with the Dracula story itself, sometimes with the actors, the cameras and all the paraphernalia of filming. In this way, he effectively alienates you from the idea of horror and then captures you unawares. The film is a tribute to earlier horror films like Nosferatu, Andrea's Vampire, and it certainly evokes some of their quality, particularly in that more lovable aspect of horror films, their use of images of a haunting and lyrical beauty.
And now, Deliverance, starring John Voigt and Burt Reynolds, directed by John Borman, who's here with me now to talk about it. Basically, it's the story of what happens when four small-town American men take a weekend canoe trip downriver before the valley is flooded. The river, as you'll see, plays a large part in the action. That's just a taste we'll be having more later. But first, let's look back at the flavour of a couple of earlier Borman films. This, incidentally, is his fifth. Borman began in television, film editor with ITN, documentary producer at BBC Bristol. His first feature film in 1965 was called Catch Us If You Can, with the Dave Clark Five and a script by Peter Nichols. Two years later, and in Hollywood, he made Point Blank, a quirky and ornate thriller starring Lee Marvin and a good deal of Los Angeles. Who the hell are you anyway? I'm Ace Walker. Where do I find Reese? I've got nothing to do with Reese. I know about you, Walker. How's your wife? She's dead. And the sister, Chris, what about her? She's with Reese now. He nailed both sisters. How does that grab you? Where's Reese? Where's Chris? She runs a club. A place called the Movie House. Two years further on, in 1969, we have Hell in the Pacific, a Hollywood title for what Borman really wanted to call the enemy. Two characters, an American and a Japanese soldier, stranded on the same island. Lee Marvin starred again with the Japanese actor Mifune. The film crews were also both American and Japanese. Here we have part of the wordless encounter between the two men. Leo the Last followed in 1970, winning the Director's Award at Cannes, though its strange allegory was less of a success with the public. And now, Deliverance. Four white-collar Americans plan a get-away-from-it-all weekend canoeing the rapids of a river before bulldozers destroy the lush valley in the name of civilization. The valley is home of the Mountain Men, a degenerate, deformed, and run-down community. The outing is dominated by Lewis, a fitness fanatic, sportsman, and archer, full of the romantic conflict of man's survival against nature. With him go Drew, the likeable family man with a fondness for the guitar, Bobby, the chubby and jovial bachelor of the party, and Ed Gentry, played by Voigt, the unsure yet capable figure who, in the novel by James Dickey, tells the story in the first person. Here, Ed and Lewis talk together. Machines are going to fail. And the system's going to fail. 
And then? And then what? Then survival. Who has the ability to survive? That's the game. Survival. And you can't wait for it to happen, can you? You can't wait for it. Well, the system's done all right by me. Oh, yeah. You got a nice job. Got a nice house. Nice wife. Nice kids. You make that sound rather shitty, Lewis. Why do you go on these trips with me, Ed? I like my life, Lewis. Yeah, but why do you go on these trips with me? You know, sometimes I wonder about that. Yes, do you, Lewis? Once underway, the two canoes get separated. Bobby and Ed stray on land, are captured by two mountain men, and Bobby sexually assaulted. Lewis fells the attacker, and from there on, the plot revolves around how best to survive the crime, drawing them, as it does, into more and more trouble. When the whole adventure is over, lying in his hospital bed, Ed murmurs, that's lovely, chrome, hot water, tissues, lovely seems there's plenty to be said for civilization after all. And the noble savage is simply a city dweller's fantasy. Taken at any level, from adventure to allegory, deliverance is exciting and enthralling. It's also a tribute to the physical stamina of its makers. John Borman, what was it like to see it, uh, to make it rather? Because seeing it with all the river everywhere, the camera very often up to the eye line in water, it showed that you were right in there. Well, it's more exciting to watch than it was to make, you know. Uh, it was... The problem was really to find a river that was appropriate, that was a wild, untamed river. And I looked all over America, and uh, there really aren't any left except this one and one or two others. And this... The reason this river is so beautiful is and so wild and so unspoiled is just that... Uh, uh, is that people can't get to it. It's almost completely inaccessible. So how we shot it was that we would go take by jeep, take the canoes, and uh, rumble through the woods for about an hour, and we'd clamber down to the river, and then we'd uh, get in, uh, the four actors in two canoes, and the cameraman and myself in another canoe, and then a rubber boat with uh, two other guys and some equipment, and we'd sh drift off down the river. And then we'd stop at horrendous looking rapids and shoot, shoot film. And then we'd be picked up, hopefully, downriver by, by the rest of the crew. And uh, that's the way we did it. Well, it's we all became very good canoeists. I mean, I became a really, I was really an expert canoeist because I, was, I did a lot of canoeing when I was searching for a river, you know. And then I came to cast the film, and I looked around for, for, for actors who could canoe. And I didn't find any, but I thought that Voight and Reynolds were actors who seemed to me to have the, 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 the potential of becoming great canoeists, which was essential, really, for being in this film. Was it hazardous? Oh, it was enormously hazardous, yeah. I mean, my assistant director s said he'd been working in Hollywood for 30 years, and he said that this, he'd never uh, done a film which was as physically uh, harrowing as this one. You shot it in sequence, didn't you, which is very unusual for... Yeah, you shot it in sequence simply because the, mo the story roughly takes a starts at the top of the river and works its way down to the end, you know. And uh, so there was no other way of doing it because you can't go upstream uh, on, on a river like that. You can only go down and how under. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, uh, and under. There's plenty of that. Um, how do you feel that th the film you've made differs from the novel that James Dickey wrote? Well, it's, it's quite close to the book. It's the first time I've ever made a film which was based on a substantial piece of material. And the story was, 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 was marvelously sort of cinematic, really. The novel was very cinematic. Uh, and so I largely followed the story, except I think in emphasis, really. I think that Dickey, who's a marvelously complex and fascinating man, uh, very much represents the South, really, in, in a way, in that he's, he's you know, he's 
on one hand he's sort of brutal and on the other hand he's very sensitive and you never know where these things I mean the, the South had a terribly bad press um, and but it's difficult to talk about really in a, in a sympathetic way the South because it's like saying well you know let's assume Hitler hadn't uh, done that to the Jews then you know and, uh, but because uh, there's all, all that problem lurks there the, the black problem but uh, he um, I think what, where it did differ slightly was that in emphasis was that Dickey was somewhat following the kind of Hemingway, Sam Peckinpah tradition of uh, that violence makes a man of you, you know, the male, American male virility rights. And we were saying, I say we, myself and John Voight, in the interpretation of the role, that really uh, violence doesn't do this. It's, it's violence is, is degrading, really, and, uh, and, and sobering. And, and uh, Voight, the character of Ed Gentry, is not really a better person in any film. He's somewhat... Um, He's haunted, and he's lost his innocence. I think, mean, really, that's... I mean, it's to do with loss of innocence, I think, this, this uh, film. Well, of course, there is the appalling violation, the sexual assault on one of the men, which is, the, as it were, the American dream of virility brought low. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Have, it? You, have you had problems with that in terms of the censor? Oh, enormous, yeah, enormous. Um, uh, depending on the sexual uh, leanings of the censor involved, you know, uh, but uh, I mean, it was you know in America they have this man called Aaron Stern who's a mad psychiatrist. You know he's like he reminds you of Peter Sellers at his worst. And uh, he was he he was I, mean, I had a terrible struggle with him. You know tremendous prejudice. I had to get but I got sort of women's lib to support me and. Uh, so that you've got to get well, no Where did women's lib? There are no. Well, I mean, I think women's lib in, in America were they were tremendously uh, pleased with the film that to see a man getting raped, they thought it was that this was uh, something that um, should be seen by everybody. You know, so it's a, a rather thin reason I would think for liking the film. Really, I would have thought. Well, I'm only talking about uh, using whatever yes. pressure groups Lo that one lobbying that one can, and then you know here, for instance. Uh, they cut a little bit, you know, just to say they've cut it, mm. uh, because they, 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 you know, the censor here is afraid of being attacked by the, the right and the left, and he doesn't know where he is. So if he cuts a little bit, he can say he's cut it, and uh, if he, but he hasn't cut it too much. John, you once said something that, uh, in itself, sounds rather pretentious, but I'd like you to, as it were, explain and apply it to this film. You said that most of your films were motivated by the idea of the search for the Holy Grail. That does sound awful. Well, no, I mean, it just happens to be a subject that I've been interested in for a long time. And uh, it's, uh, I find it helpful because I think it's a very basic myth. I mean, I, have, I think it's very interesting the way that the European myths w have really died, and yet they've re-emerged in the American genre film. I mean, I think that's a, you know, it's a fascinating s uh, study in that. But, um, you know, the Arthurian legend is, is a great story. And I like that kind of a story. I like quest stories, you know, and it's really as simple as that. But it, it provides a, a, a great sort of template. It, it, you can tell where you're going wrong because, I mean, stories, storytelling, I'm not a natural storyteller, but so I, I, work, I try and work from very, uh, very well-tried and established uh, basis. You like allegory in itself, don't you? And Leo the Last also had a tremendous allegorical feel about it. Now, a lot of people have said that Deliverance is about um, the American male, the American dream, man's um, destruction of nature, but his refusal to confront the harshness of nature. Do you care for all this abstract talk about the film, or do you simply want people to see it as an adventure? Well, I mean, I think that it's, it's uh, you know, a, a very exciting adventure story. I mean, that's how I see this film. However, uh, you know, a film has to be about something. I mean, it, it, has to have a voice, a spirit, and and that, you know, I, I do think about a great deal when I'm making films. Uh, I mean, I like, I do like allegory. And it's very, it's very unfashionable, particularly in uh, in England, the Anglo-Saxon world. You know, I mean, where, where they like irony, but uh, I prefer allegory, and uh, I'm just trying to get it to back into fashion. You know, there are so many uh, threads of allegory in this particular story. Which which one do you follow? Most loyally. Well, I think that, you know, underneath it, I, I, the thing that really interested me is uh, about America, and I, I see myself now, uh, after having made some three films in America, 
um, as a kind of outside observer, you know, look, watching this extraordinary scene. And I think that um, one of the things that, that, that's, that's important is that the way in which Americans, you know, in the 20s and 30s became disassociated from the land and the soil, which was, after all, the thing that, was, that America was founded on. And that, that out of this, total li lack of contact with, with nature has come a kind of madness. I think that the, the madness, the sickness uh, of America is a from, come, comes partly out of this. Uh, you see, there's nothing much else that, uh, there's no other basis. I mean, America was founded on that basis, and that's been lost. And uh, this is partly what this is about. I mean, the, the way these four men confront these people uh, in this village, I mean, they're looking in a kind of way, in a, in a kind of a distorting mirror at their own history. And uh, these people, however degenerate, are still a link with the past of America. And yet the struggle to get back to that nature is fraught with hazard because, in a sense, it's a phony uh, attempt. Oh, yeah, because their attitude towards it is quite phony, romantic, and, uh, and, and silly, really, and, uh, uh, which they find out. I mean, the, I mean, the thing about nature is that it's great in the long shots and, ter and terrifying in the close-ups, which is... What, uh, you know, I was trying to say in this. So that you would go along with, as Gentry says at the end in hospital, oh, hot water. Yes, oh, I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot to be said for civilization. If you, uh, 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 but, uh, you know, the, 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 if you lose touch with the saw totally, I think you're also in trouble. John Borman, thank you very much. And we're going to end now with one of the few heartwarming moments of the film. It's an early encounter with the mountain men when Drew and a subnormal child find they have something in common. Music. This week, a clutch of family films, an interview with Jacques Demy, director of The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, and a face to face between Alexander Walker and Michael Winner, director of The Mechanic. Jam it on the gas pedal now. All right, ready, jump. That was a slice of life and death from The Mechanic, the latest Michael Winner film, which I reviewed last week. Uh, it's caused some controversy because uh, Alexander Walker in the Evening Standard uh, felt that it was wrong, that it should have been awarded an AA certificate, that is, for suitable for showing to children over 14, and Michael Winner, the director, uh, naturally enough, perhaps thought otherwise. Alexander Walker, what really are your objections to showing it to teenagers? My objection to showing it to children of 14 and over is that it contains material that up to now hasn't been shown in films that children of that age have been admitted to. It's a film that is without sex, because this is a new pattern, but it's got a great deal of violence. Now, the violence we have seen is some of the more conventionalized violence, except perhaps that the censor prefers to see a man burnt to the crisp rather than to see two people having it off in bed. But there is in this film a great deal of brooding, methodical elimination of human life. The one scene in particular, where two men sit while a girl cuts one wrist with a razor blade, the other wrist with a blade, and proceeds to bleed into her lap, while the men determine, according to the weight of her body, how long she's got before she turns lightheaded, gets cold, and dies. And eventually, they throw her the car keys and tell her to get off to the police station. Uh, to my mind, I would think that any child of 14 seeing that uh, would probably be shocked. Well, isn't that a good thing, in a way? Uh, I mean, are they going to be encouraged either to kill themselves or to kill other people in consequence of this? I'm not sure whether they will be. I don't think the evidence either way is conclusive. Michael Winner, what do you think about that scene? Well, that scene is very similar to a scene that was in a film called Running Scared last year, which Alex liked. It's, it, the description can be applied, but it, you don't really see this happening. You don't see her, any blood coming from her wrists ever. No, yes, you except do. Except for a second when she slashes one wrist. It's all the way how it's done. I think one's quibbling enormously about... Uh, whether four years more makes someone fit to see the film. I think it's very distant violence. I don't no, it's think not it's, distant uh, violence at all, Michael. When she gets up, her, blood is her lap is covered with blood. 
But in any case, that's only one example of a film that places the entire emphasis on how you kill people. Well, the censor you know very well has given you a double A certificate because you don't see very much actual destruction of, of the body. The viscera doesn't spurt forth, as it does in some other pictures that have rightly got an X like The Godfather. But nevertheless, the relationship between this older man and the younger kid is that of a mentor and an apprentice. And for someone to be brought up to have his responses killed, his human responses killed, and his lethal mechanical responses trained, seems to me to make an obnoxious film. Right, put it in the, a in the X certificate, that's what it was meant for, but make sure that kids today don't get in and see it. Well, I don't agree that's what it was meant for, nor do the censors of this country or America, and nor do most of the people who've seen He's it. He's regretting that now, the censor well, of this I, country. Well, I, he wasn't regretting it when I spoke to him a couple of days ago. He said, if we can't put this in the AA category, what can we? I agree. But, Alex, I find your views on censorship very confused. May I quote you from your own paper? You say in a letter this week that you've constantly asked for an end to censorship of films for adults. That is, any film should be shown to adults. A few months ago, when you reviewed... Uh, the film Straw Dogs, you said to pass this film for public exhibition is tantamount to a dereliction of mm. duty. Now, in I don't its, understand how... In, in its present form. Well, in its present form... That was written at a time when Mr Murphy, who was a film censor, was not passing other films in their present form for public exhibition. And those films, like Trash, Andy Warhol's film, had a great deal of explicit sex in it. This seems the, the double standard that the film censor today, who really should be here as well... But aren't you actually uh, have, trying to have it both ways too, Michael? After all, you, you produce a film which has some very sensational material, and you then affect to be surprised that anyone finds it sensational. Surely this stuff is put there because it excites and interests people, and to suppose that it has no effect on them is surely a trifle either naive or, well, tendentious. Well, it wasn't it? put there in order to excite people. It was in the script, and we shot it. Uh, I can't people? say, having seen that that it's something that would normally get an X certificate, that type of violence of people falling off cliffs having been shot, as Alex says, rather distant no, that's, we're only taking one. Films. We're only taking, excuse me, we're only taking one example there that we saw at the beginning of this well, program an of people of a falling off cliffs. In film you, there is an, an example AA. at the beginning of this film of a man being blown up in his apartment. Well, you never see him blown up at all. Exactly, that's you why you know perfectly well the film has been, has been engineered. It's well titled The Mechanic because it's a piece of mechanical engineering to appeal to the violence that many people today find exciting it doesn't break. and also to get past the censor. No, it was never done to get past the censor. It makes no difference to me whether it's an AA well, or an X or whatever. You must congratu congratulate yourself no on an unplanned uh, victory. In fact, then. you know, there are those who say an X is more helpful for this sort of film. No victory at all. I think the film got the certificate it merited. We weren't trying to get an AA. In fact, I think if I had to say what I thought it should have, I think it should have had an A, which it's got in America, mm. the equivalent of an A. I don't is, see uh, why you keep referring to the American experience. It's a quite different uh, type of censorship over there. It takes a different attitude towards violence, which it too may be regretting now. We're talking about our censor here. The censor has let this film through, and you know perfectly well that queuing up outside his office at the moment are other people, maybe not as reputable as you are, Michael, maybe not as skillful, because it is a skillfully made film, who have got films that they're saying to the censor, you let that get by in the mechanic, why can't you let me have an AA certificate well, for I my film of violence too? The so censorship right. of time cuts in at this point. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very much indeed. Film industry is always being accused of not producing the kind of films that, that people can take their families to, as if some stern fellow were refusing to give the public something they longed to buy. In fact, of course, the industry gladly give the public anything it showed half an inclination to queue for. And at Christmas time in particular, it does its best to produce the kind of lollipop movies on which it's hoped that whole droves of family audiences will suck for as long as their cinematic stomachs can stand it. The Amazing Mr. Blunden is Lionel Jeffrey's second film as director. The first was The Railway Children, and here he continues in the period style which he managed so well before. The story is rather complicated, starting in 1918 with a destitute widow being mysteriously hired as caretaker for a big deserted house in the country, and then flashing back to 1818 when bad things happened at the hall. Two children from 1918 team up with a pair from 1818 and manage to commute back and forth through time with the aid of one of those timely potions whose recipes litter English country libraries. The film is done with taste and enthusiasm. Mr. Jeffries may be partial to a kind of sentiment which is rather dated, but he shows his partiality by a kind of affectionate skittishness which finally wins one over. The ghostly visitors, each pair of children being ghosts when they cross their particular date line, play all the tricks we want them to play and manage to convey the sort of earnest affection for each other which stops short of mawkishness and seems absolutely right for the time. The film has craftsmanship and the kind of integrity which makes sure that children aren't shortchanged. Value for money, in other words.
Lucy. Lucy. At last. We have found someone with a little good sense. Uh, I beg your pardon? You didn't run away screaming. You didn't run away. Well, I did. First I did. Well, I'm sorry, but in the mist, I thought you were, well, ghosts. They do say the house is haunted, you know. Yes, we did know. I suppose if we say that we are ghosts, you will run away. Mr. Blunden said children of our own age. You are ghosts. You really are. But if you are ghosts, then you must be dead. Of course we're not dead. You do say some stupid things, don't you? We're no more dead than you are. You can be a ghost, but you don't have to be dead. He's really too young to understand. <laughs> the French director, Jacques Demy, has two films soon to be released, Magic Donkey and The Pied Piper. He's made eight since he and his contemporaries, including Godard and Truffaut, began the new wave. On his last visit to London, he talked to Film 72 about his career. At the time, so it's uh, between 1955 and 1960, the film industry became in France very dull. The film, films were uh, all the same, I mean, kind of routine, and nothing new, nothing uh, exciting. We were a group of friends, so Chabrol, Truffaut, Godard, Romer, and uh, Rivette, myself, uh, always together on speaking about films. And we met so, some ideas about how they should be and how we should do, I mean, because there was no hope whatsoever. Uh, to become a director be before being uh, 40 years old. Uh, it was hopeless, really. And, and uh, so we said, we started to say, now there is a new film coming out, I mean, new uh, pellicule, who is much quicker. Uh, so we don't need lighting. Uh, the sound is on magnetic track. We can use a lighter uh, equipment. We don't need uh, so many weeks of shooting. We can do this and that. And so we are looking for new cameraman, new sound man. And we decided, I mean, to have a, it was also a kind of moral attitude about what we were going to say, uh, to tell, and, and, and how to tell it. And from that started a chase, the chase of, of producers. And every day we were, you know, uh, knocking doors and ringing phones and, and calling people, saying, uh, so, we've got stories and we want to do that and that and that. Uh, Godard was uh, one of the first to start with uh, Breathless. He made it, uh, I mean, for very, very little money and very quickly. Uh, also, we made a kind of pressure on the union because the union was very, very, very strong and we couldn't do anything. Uh, without them, but the business was so bad that, you know, we reached kind of agreement. And I shot Lola, my first film, for example, with uh, seven people in my crew. Like a silent movie, I didn't even add a guide track. We dubbed everything after. I made a film called Umbrellas of Cherbourg. I started by the end of it. I said, what am I going to do? I would like to make the people crying. I want to make them cry. So I did. I wrote a story in, for that purpose, to make them more tender or think, you know, about their first love or whatever, and make them really crying. And I succeeded. I was pleased. Then after that, I made another film called uh, Young Girls of Rochefort. And I said, what a dream if people coming out of the theater could dance and sing and, and be happy. What am I going to do for that? And I wrote a story. A lot of people really were very happy. I was happy too. That's my... So it's as simple as that, but it's beautiful if you can communicate like that. 
and bring something. It's marvelous. Better than money, I tell you. In 67, in what, February 67, I believe. And I left because nothing was happening in France, just nothing. France was dead, completely. And I was so bored that I wanted, I mean, I wanted to do something. I was, what, 36 years old. I had everything I wished in, in France. I mean, people, they, we liked, they liked my films and I was really, uh, I mean, I had a lot of friends, and, and I felt very good, but that wasn't enough. And I wanted something else, and I read an article about uh, San Francisco. I took a plane, and I went there, and I was fascinated because something was happening. <laughs> as a documentary. I wanted to call it uh, Los Angeles 68, like uh, Rossellini when he made uh, Allemagne, Year Zero, or, you know, things like that. It was very, always interesting. Uh, with that feeling, I mean, that was for me to say in, uh, so 20 years from now, I would be able to look at the film and say, ah, oh, that was Los Angeles in 68, and it was fabulous. It was like that. For example, I, I just, I come back from uh, Los Angeles and it's completely different now. It's in that meaning that Model Shop was a documentary. It's another city. Let's, I mean, you know, the streets were full of uh, hitchhikers. Not anymore. Nobody wants to take any, anyone. I mean, it's really uh, full of fears. Uh, it's a complete change. <laughs> Together to the zoo, everything forbidden. 